Over the past four years, between 2019 and 2023, SpaceX has launched 130 Starlink missions, deploying a total of 5,625 Starlink satellites. These launches consist of 1,735 version 1.0 satellites, including the original 0.9 satellites, 2,977 version 1.5 satellites, and 913 version 2 mini satellites. With Rocket Lab's Falcon 9 competitor coming to market later this year, let's run the numbers to test the economics of what it would look like if Rocket Lab were to build and deploy a Starlink competitor. My name is Scott. Welcome to the channel. Let's talk Rocket Lab. Payload capacity. For the Falcon 9 Starlink missions, the average payload mass for each iteration of Starlink satellite was within the range of 15 to 17 tons. More recent deployments of the version 2 mini satellites have seen 18,400 kilograms, or 80% of the Falcon 9's maximum capacity of 22,800 kilograms. The remaining 20% of the Falcon 9's capability is utilized in order to bring the rocket back home, generally in the form of a downrange drone ship landing. Let's compare these numbers to Rocket Lab's Neutron. Taking the 80% of Neutron's maximum capacity of 15 tons, we can expect the Neutron to deliver 12 tons. Comparing this to Rocket Lab's website, Rocket Lab is targeting 13 ton downrange landings, which is 86.6% .6 of Neutron's maximum capacity. As always, we're going to use the more conservative value, in this case the 80%, rather than the 87% we landed on a moment ago, arriving us at a deployment assumption of 12 tons per launch. Mass per satellite. The mass for each Starlink iteration has increased over time. Early Starlink satellites were 227 kilograms, whereas the upcoming version 2.0 satellites will be 1,000 kilograms heavier. To save some time, we'll divide each iteration of Starlink satellite by the 12 tons we arrived at in the previous step, giving us an approximation of how many satellites we can expect on board with each launch. We'll use 40 satellites per launch, which not only mimics the median, but also the most launched iteration of Starlink satellite. The last variable we need is cadence. For this, let's listen to a clip from Rocket Lab's most recent earnings call. I wanted to, to ask on Neutron, after that first launch, what sort of rate do you envision doing Neutron launches and what rate are you capacitized to support now? At what point would you need to sort of add uh, capacity in there? We're not trying to do anything Herculean on Neutron. We've lived through the pain of creating a launch vehicle and standing it up and bringing it into production. So it follows a pretty pretty similar cadence profile to what we were able to achieve with Electron. So we'll do a test flight or a couple of test flights and then move into sort of three or four a year and then continue to bootstrap and grow that and really follow the same model that we followed with Electron, where uh, we launch a little bit, we generate some revenue and make improvements to the vehicle, and we make improvements to the infrastructure. So if the Neutron is expected to follow a similar cadence to the Electron, let's start there. In the Electron's seven years of launch service, launch cadence has gone from one test flight in 2017 to 10 successful launches in 2023. For Neutron, we'll use a similar cadence with a slight upward revision that accounts for transferable efficiencies that were learned from the Electron. We have the Neutron going from two launches in its first year to 15 launches in its seventh year. And since we're comparing SpaceX to Rocket Lab, let's also include the Falcon 9's initial launch cadence. We also need to keep in mind that Rocket Lab still needs to be operating for others during this period in order to keep the lights on. So let's hop back to SpaceX. Since the Falcon 9 began delivering Starlink satellites, Roughly two-thirds of SpaceX's launches have been Starlink-specific. Let's take Neutron's assumed launch cadence, then give it a similar treatment where one-third of the launches are external and the other two-thirds are internal. Multiplying the internal launches by 40 satellites per launch nets 1,520 cumulative satellites delivered. SpaceX, by comparison, had this many cumulative Starlink satellites delivered back in the first half of 2021, a period in which SpaceX had more than 50,000 Starlink subscribers and a private valuation of $74 billion, a 2,860% increase from Rocket Lab's $2.5 billion valuation. Hey guys, Scott from the future here. The video that you're currently watching was recorded at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, and a little over an hour later, the news of the convertible offering broke. So in the video, the market cap is referenced to be about $2.5 billion. That's taken an obvious haircut. It's just south of two billion. So in other words, Rocket Lab is down about 445 million on the news of a $300 million convertible offering or 355 if you include the optional 55 million. 
Um, on Wednesday when the news broke, this was originally 275 plus 41.25 optional. And now the agreement is 300 million plus 55 optional. So as far as the impact on this video, when the market cap is mentioned to be 2.5 billion, it's obviously going to be a little bit lower. I was also reached out to somebody who was asking how this will affect the model. In brief terms, it won't. If we look out to the end of 2030 to where we're at, it has an additional 174 million shares baked in. And if I understand these terms correctly for the conversion deal, and if the math is correct, I'm expecting an additional 50 million shares to dilute the pie. So not even a third of what we have baked into the model is what was just announced. Now, this is not surprising at all. I think it was three months ago, I made a video that was comparing Rocket Lab and Astra's cash burn. And the conclusion for that video was that Rocket Lab basically has till, uh, I think it was the middle of 2026, in order to break even, right the ship, so to speak. But of course, they're not going to wait until the plane is scraping the ground before they pull up. So as far as raising capital, it was expected. You know, to take it even a step further, I was waiting on this event because I knew that it was going to happen. And when it was going to happen, I knew the... Well, I shouldn't say I knew. I, I assumed that the the market would kind of overreact. And I've been kind of an advocate that Rocket Lab is or has been overvalued or, or I guess more specifically that the neutron is baked in already, uh, partially at, at least. And so when this dilution news broke and when Rocket Lab react, kind of overreacted the way it did, maybe overreacted isn't the right word, but it brought Rocket Lab to what I would consider to be a fair, fairer buying price. It's closer to reality now than I think it was trading previously. So as a result, I increased my position by a little bit. Well, not a little bit. I increased my position by 50%. Like I said, I've been kind of waiting with fingers crossed that this news would happen and that the that the market would kind of react the way it did. So I used it as an opportunity to add to my position. I mean, my wife even added to her position. I mean, my, my mom, my mom even opened a position in Rocket Lab yesterday. So that should tell you kind of where I'm at with Rocket Lab, with the whole conversion offering, with the whole debt raising. I mean, there's a little bit more to talk about, but I suppose we can save that for a video, like a, some sort of like pre Q4 release, that sort of a deal. So all in all, not worried about this uh, dilution at all. It's kind of par for the course. So I'll wrap this monologue up and I will pass it back to Scott from the past. Keep in mind, this is modeled seven years out from Neutron's debut. So this will put us out to 2031. So taking 2.5 billion in 2024 and growing it to 74 billion in 2031 is a compounded average growth rate of 62.5%. So before we wrap things up, I wanna know, is this too bullish? Is this not bullish enough? Let me know in the comments below. Important context to these numbers is that none of these figures reflect dilution. Additionally, this entire scenario is hypothetical, so none of this is financial advice. If you're new to the channel, thank you for stopping in. Be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. And if you got value from the video, be sure to leave a like and check out the Patreon to view and download the valuation models that I referenced to make these videos here. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. Have a great day.